mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all turn to Matthew 26, uh, to uh, our text this morning. Matthew chapter 26, the story of uh, Mary giving her very best to Jesus when she <clears throat> put the ointment, the perfume ointment on his head. You know, worship is very, very important to us as Christians. We uh, don't take our worship of Jesus lightly. We can't, because God commanded us, first of all, to worship Him, and second of all, He delights in it. In, in worship, we give God, we give, we give Christ His honor and His praise, like Mary did. Now, our text today tells us about a woman named Mary who gave honor and worship to Jesus. We are told that she gave a gift to Jesus, where people said she went overboard. <clears throat> she was excessive. She went over the top. She simply gave too much. People were there. The disciples were there. The followers of Jesus were there. And they criticized Mary for what she gave. Now, Mary was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And this story takes place a few days after Lazarus was resurrected. Remember Jesus going to the tomb and raising Lazarus out of the tomb? This story that we're talking about now happened a few days after that. And this story today happens just before that Thursday when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and then tried and then died on Good Friday. This story takes place just the day before. Okay, so I kind of want you to get that, get the time sequence here. Now, <clears throat> There are those folks who say that her worship was extravagant. Well, maybe I would agree that it was, in a good way. Now, you know, talk about extravagance. I would say that spending $40,000 on a wedding is extravagant. I would say... Uh, Spending $500 a night in a motel is extravagant. I would say spending $100,000 on a vehicle or $120,000 on a vehicle is extravagant. I think you'd all agree. And I think we'd all agree that what Mary did was extravagant. It went beyond what certainly what was expected of her. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk this morning about extravagant worship. Why was Mary's <clears throat> response to Jesus extravagant? Why was her worship extravagant? What's it all mean? So let's talk about that. <clears throat> and we'll do it verse by verse, or two verses at a time. <clears throat> First of all, I believe that extravagant worship is un. Restrained, unrestrained. Let us begin with verse 6 and 7. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Now again, picture the scene with me. Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. This story more than likely happens on that Wednesday after the Sunday. And it's the night before the night that he was betrayed. And just a few days earlier from this, Lazarus was called out of the tomb alive. And so Jesus was sharing a meal with Mary with Martha, with Lazarus. Not in their home, but in the home of, 
a man by the name of Simon the leper. Now, more than likely, Simon the leper was one who had been had, had leprosy and was cured, which was also the reason why he wanted the dinner at his house because because he also loved Jesus very much. So here we have three, four people in this home, all who loved Jesus very, very much. They knew Jesus was the Son of God. And somehow or other, I think they also knew this would be his last meal that he would eat. And they also knew that he was about to come to the end of his life. In her hand, Mary had a, what's called an alabaster jar of perfume. And you notice it says, a very expensive perfume. Now, it doesn't tell us in this text, but it tells us in John's Gospel, he also records the story, that um, this was worth a whole year's labor. The perfume was that expensive. In other words, so what's the average uh, income here in the Flathead, would you say, uh, per family? 35,000? 40,000 is average, maybe? Annual income? 35, 40,000? That's how much that perfume was worth. A whole year's work. Where she got it from, we don't know. More than likely, she got it from her mother, grandmother, great grandmother, it passed out. Don't know where she would get such expensive perfume. This kind of perfume, this is called nard, spike nard, was made in India, grows in a plant, and that's why it was so very expensive. Now she knew how expensive this perfume was. She knew it was worth $35,000, let's say. But she also understood the value of her Lord, the value of Jesus. And so she was unrestrained. The action was unrestrained. The financial cost didn't restrain her. The emotional cost didn't restrain her. The worrying about what other people would say didn't restrain her. She knew more than likely that there were going to be people there that would not like what she was doing. But she did anyway. Jesus was her whole focus. She wanted it for Jesus. She didn't wait. She didn't think about it. She didn't stall or put it off. She just gave it to Jesus. She put it over Jesus' head. And it's just like a, like a person is, is, is what, uh, uh, anointed as king. She anointed him as her king by pouring over her, his head. But we know that this act of worship was not appreciated by everybody, was it? In fact, that's our second point. Extravagant worship isn't just unrestrained, it's also impractical to many people. It's impractical. Here's what the text says, verse 8 and 9. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor. In other words, what in the world is this woman thinking? What, why is the waste? Pouring out $35,000 worth of perfume on somebody's head? Come on, lady. What are you doing? Why not a bottle of aqua valva? Or Old Spice? Why not something from Walmart or Kmart or... Shop go, why? $35,000 worth of perfume. Do you realize what you're doing, lady? <coughs> See, they saw, the disciples saw what she was doing as being very impractical. Very impractical. But you know, that's what extravagant worship is all about. It is very impractical. It is impractical to spend an hour every Sunday morning or two hours or three hours every Sunday morning 
up at 5447 Highway 35. It is impractical, especially when you have so much to do, so little time to do it. It's impractical to spend an hour each day studying God's Word and praying. That is to the world. It's very impractical. It's very impractical to give to the Lord a, a, a tithe every Sunday of what you make during the week when you have lots of bills at home that need to be paid. Extravagant worship is very impractical to the world. The world thinks it's foolish. Foolish to gather together every Sunday morning with your family and, and worship the Lord. It's very impractical. There's many other things that have been done. So you see, her extravagant worship was impractical even to the disciples, but not to Jesus. Not to Jesus at all. In fact, what does Jesus say about what she did? Let's look at it. And that's our third point. That ex extravagant worship is also irreproachable. Irreproachable. Not just impractical to the world, but it's irreproachable. Look at verse 10 and 11. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, that's the disciples, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you will not always have me. See, Jesus called them out on this thing. Why are you giving Mary a hard time? Leave her alone. Now, Jesus didn't have anything against the poor. In fact, Jesus often talked about giving to the poor. But Mary was putting first things first like she did some other time. Remember the other time when she put first things first? Remember the story of Mary and Martha when Jesus came to visit them in Bethany? Maybe several months before this happened? And Martha was busy in the kitchen? And where was Mary? Where was Mary? <laughs> Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And again, remember Jesus had to correct Martha and defend Mary. And here again, she de he defends Mary for her extravagant worship for what she was doing. And even though she could have given that $35,000 to the poor, Jesus says, no. The poor will always be there. You can take care of the poor. But I'll not always be here. And I think that Mary knew that the time was come for Jesus to complete his mission. And that's why she did what she did. Her love was unreproachable. She didn't care. She really didn't care what others said of her. Her heart moved her to do it. Her love for Jesus moved her to pour that ointment, that perfume over him. And then, one other thing. Extravagant worship is also unsurpassed. Look at verse 12 and 13. Unsurpassed. When she poured this perfume on my body, Jesus says, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. <clears throat> See, all the money that, for example, Judas had in his money bag had certain value. <clears throat> the silver coins that Judas received for betraying Jesus had certain value. This perfume that this woman had in this bottle had certain value. But my question is, where is all of that now? In other words, where are those 30 pieces of silver now? Even though they had value then. They're gone. They're returned to dust. We don't know where they're at. 
Who knows where those 30 pieces of silver are? They're of no value anymore. Or, or where, where is the, the 30, where, where is this uh, bottle that this woman had the perfume in? Where is that bottle at? It's gone. Where's the perfume? Where would the perfume have gone? Let, let's say she would have left the perfume at home. And, and let it up there on a, a nice pedestal in her house. Uh, where would it be today if she had not used it on Jesus? Well, chances are the Roman soldiers would have come 20 years, 30 years later, which they did, destroyed Jerusalem, and destroyed the bottle and destroyed the perfume. That's what would have happened to her. You see, Mary use that perfume that would have been destroyed later on anyway or used up by somebody she used it for a good purpose she used it as worship for Jesus she used it as a way to show her love for her Lord how many times have you gone into uh, her burgers or J.C. Penney's and had one of these ladies put that cheap perfume on you. <laughs> and you couldn't get rid of that perfume smell for nothing. <clears throat> you guys, you'd go home and you'd hope that your wife wouldn't <laughs> smell it. Because <laughs> you have to explain where you were. Yeah. That stuff just hangs on. Even take a shower, and after your shower, you still smell it. It's that cheap perfume. No. Jesus, just think of that. Jesus had this whole bottle of perfume poured on him. And the Bible says that that scent filled the whole room. And I can imagine he left that dinner that night and when he rested in the Garden of Gethsemane he could still smell that he remembered Mary and what she did for him I would think he went to the cross of Calvary he still smelled that on him at least in his mind if not physically still smelled that beautiful beautiful smell of what Mary it's her worship. It's her love. That was what's important. She loved her Lord and she showed it by what she did. Again, it isn't the perfume that was important to Jesus. But it's the love that was behind that perfume. That's what made it such a beautiful thing. And then one last thing I want to share with you too. And that's this. Elegant worship is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. What Mary did was sacrificial. The perfume was costly. She gave him the best she had. That's worship. And that's what God has demanded always from his people. Not just the fruit of the vine, but the first fruit of a vine. Not just the cattle of the fields, but the firstborn of the cattle of the fields. Not just the lamb, but a perfect lamb, unblemished. You see, God always asks of the best, because that's worship when we give him the best of ourselves. Mary doesn't hold back in her giving. She doesn't hold back like we sometimes do. You know, it's so easy for us to offer Jesus easy things, convenient things, convenient time, leftover things. But what God really, really wants of each of us is ourselves. <coughs> ourselves. Again, it's not the perfume. It's not the things we give to God. It's what's in here. That's what it comes from.
I'm going to finish with a story today. And uh, it's a touchy story, I think, of a little boy. And um, in a rural town in Tennessee, <clears throat> this happens back in the 1950s, according to the author, 1950s, sometime back then. And it goes like this. Tommy's house was in a poor area of this Tennessee town. A church had a bus ministry that came knocking on his door one Saturday afternoon. Tommy came to the answer of the door and greeted the bus pastor. The bus pastor asked if his parents were home. And Tommy told him that his parents take off every weekend and leave him at home to take care of his little brother. The bus pastor asked to come in and talk with Tommy. They went into the living room and sat down on an old couch with the foam and springs exposed. The bus pastor asked the kid, where do you go to church? Tommy surprised the visitor by replying, I've never been to church in my whole life. The bus pastor thought to himself about the fact that his church was less than three miles from Tommy's house. Are you sure you've never been to church? He asked again. I sure haven't, said Tommy. Then the bus pastor said, Well, son, more important than going to church, have you ever heard about Jesus? And then the bus pastor proceeded to share the gospel of Jesus with Tommy. The young lad's heart began to be tenderized, and at the end of the bus pastor's story, the bus pastor asked if Tommy wanted to receive this free gift of salvation from God. <clears throat> Tommy said, you bet. And so Tommy and the bus pastor got on their knees and, and Tommy invited Jesus into his little heart and received the free gift of salvation. They both stood up and the bus pastor asked if he could pick up Tommy for church the next morning. Sure, Tommy said. The bus pastor picked Tommy up the next morning. Keep in mind that this boy had never been to church before. The church was a real big one. And the little kid just sat there, clueless of what was going on. A few minutes into the service, these tall, unhappy guys walked down to the front and picked up some wooden plates. One of the men prayed, and the kid and the Tommy, with utter fascination, watched them walk up and down the aisles with this plate. He still didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning, <clears throat> it hit Tommy what was taking place. <clears throat> These people must be giving money to Jesus. He then reflected on the free gift of life that he had received just 24 hours before. He immediately searched his pocket front and back and couldn't find a thing to give to Jesus. By this time, the offering plate was being passed down his aisle with a broken heart, he just grabbed the plate and held on to it. He finally let go of it and watched it pass on down the aisle. He turned around to see it pass down the aisle behind him. Then his eyes remained glued on that plate as it was passed back and forth, back and forth, all the way to the back of the sanctuary. Then he had an idea. This little nine-year-old boy, in front of God and everybody, just like Mary, unrestrained, got up out of his seat. He walked about eight rows back, grabbed the usher by the coat, and asked to hold the plate one more time. Then he did the most astounding thing. He took the plate, sat it on the carpeted church floor, and stepped into the center of the plate. <clears throat> As he stood there, he lifted his little head up and said, Jesus, I don't have anything to give you today, but just me. I just give you me. That's extravagant worship. That's what Mary did, did she not? Mary gave her heart to Jesus. And that's what God wants of us in our worship. It's our heart. It's us. That's what's at. Jesus died on the cross for Mary. Two days later, on Good Friday. Jesus died for Martha, too. 
and for Lazarus and for Simon the leper. And Jesus died for everyone on that Good Friday. So that all of us give our hearts to God because God's the one who gave his heart to us. God gives first. Our heart is something that responds to his heart. Our love is something that responds to his love. That's the way it is. And so we thank God for this wonderful text today that just opens it up for all of us that we can always know that we belong to Jesus like Mary did. And we too can worship extravagantly by giving ourselves to him. In Jesus' name.